Well, welcome to our table this morning. We're so glad you're here. And uh, this is my wife, Ritzy. If you've not met Ritzy before, would you give her a big welcome? And uh, we're so glad to be able to come on this Mother's Day. And I could think of no better person to surround myself with than my wife, who is an incredible mother. And I mean that. I'm just so grateful and so blessed. Maybe you feel this way, uh, husbands and men in the room, but I just feel so blessed to have the mom that I was raised with. And my mom is actually here at church today, and so that's always a real privilege. And uh, just the encouragement she continues to be in my life. And then for my wife, who just leads our children so well and uh, was willing to come up with me today. Did you bring your mic? You didn't even bring your mic, so it's sitting right there, and Josiah, she's really not determined to talk today. Try and see if it works. So you say hello. Hello. Hey, it does. Uh, anyway, we're so glad to be here, and it's really fun for me. I, I get to be up here every week, but really fun for me to um, lovingly welcome my wife up to the platform, where she loves to be as well. <clears throat> and... Um, she must really love me. So, um, but we're going to be inviting some moms up today to share with you. But uh, I do, I do want to say this just briefly. We understand. We've we've talked a lot about this as Mother's Day come. There are there are. It's such a great day. It's such a so important to honor what mothers have done and the sacrifice they have made. To give honor is is right. The Bible talks about that. But we are aware as well that this can be a painful day for many. Uh, whether you are still desiring to be a mother or whether that has been something you haven't been able to do in the natural sense, that can bring a lot of grief, and we understand that. And so I want to be sensitive and just say to you today, I, I am praying for any of you. Maybe it's the loss of a mother or maybe a mother that just really wasn't there for you. And we just want to pray today that God will do something in you to restore hope and joy and celebration even in this day that you'll be able to know that, that God is on the throne and he loves you and cares for you. And it's also an incredible opportunity, and many of you have understood this, that there are spiritual moms in our lives that we all need. And there are children who never had a mom who need a spiritual mom, and there are moms who never had children who have that desire to spiritually be there for other people. And isn't it incredible how God can bring those relationships into your life? And so thank you to every one of you, all the women who have mothered, who have been spiritual mothers, grandmothers, even stepmoms, a tough, a tough place. And I'm so appreciative of how you're able to navigate that and to step in and to really help as we do. Ladies, you are helping to raise that next generation of, of young uh, boys and girls to l look like Christ and to follow Christ. So thank you so much for that. And I also want to say today, thank you to Barry Cooper and Tom Ross. If you remember last year, we had this beautiful table. We had borrowed it from the Decorating Center in Mifflinburg. They were so gracious to let us use it. And since then, uh, Barry came to me at some point and said, how would you like to have one of those tables for yourself? And I said, man, that would be awesome for the church to have. And so Barry and Tom Ross got together. I'm not sure that there were any others, but this beautiful table today is ours. And we have this beautiful table to enjoy. Can you thank those guys for that incredible sacrifice wherever he is today? I'm looking for him, but praise the Lord. So... Like I said, we're going to invite uh, several moms up today, but first, I want to just talk to you about this series we're in, because we're going to stay in the series, and we're in a series entitled, Follow, Being Committed to Do What God Calls Us to Do. The importance of following Jesus is really important. Last week, we remember, we had fun with the answer is yes, and I want to encourage you again that even before God asks you to do the next thing that he will ask you to do that your answer to the Lord would be, Lord, before you even speak, before you even ask me to do that next thing, Lord, the answer is, you didn't forget. That's great. That's good. Even without the kids in here. Uh, and, and I want to remind you to put on your yes faces, to be a yes face, not only in church, which is helpful to the pastor, but more importantly in your life, to, to have a face, uh, a willingness, a countenance before the Lord that says, Lord, I am committed to you, and I will do what you call me to do. doesn't mean I won't wrestle with it or it might not be challenging, but I will do what you call me to do. How many of you are ready to be yes people? Say yes. yes. All right, great. Well, today we're talking about loving 
like Christ. And it's an incredible thing to think about how we can follow Jesus in the way of love. This was one of the key messages that Jesus gave when he was on the earth. And we're talking about loving like Christ. And we can think of no better way to demonstrate that than what mothers learn. Because if anyone has learned how to love like Christ, I often look to the women around me who really lean into that in a very unique and special way. And I think we can learn a lot from how mothers learn to love their own children and how that comes very naturally to uh, Christian uh, mothers. And again, knowing that not all moms get that, do that well, but when we are in Christ, the Lord allows us to love like Christ. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, I think this could be the perfect verse for moms today, okay? If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, some of you with your children, that's what you're constantly doing, giving over your body to hardship and giving money to the poor. Can I get an amen? Okay, I know that's not what that really means, but you feel that way sometimes, like, who are these poor children? You ever see the things on TV where they're asking to help the children and you're thinking, can I take up a donation for these poor children in my house? They They don't have any money. What are they doing? And they're just constantly asking for more. But no, the Bible calls us to have love and that if we do all of, think about it, mom, today, dad, you can certainly apply this as well and others, but moms, when you are giving everything, the Bible is super clear. If you do all of that, give all that sacrifice and those endless nights and and all that it took to get your child to where they are, especially when they're young and their dependency upon you, if you do all of that but have no love, you gain nothing. Oh my goodness, what a sad commentary to think in life that we would do all of that, you would give all that sacrifice, and in the heavenlies, it doesn't bear fruit, and you've gained nothing because you didn't do it out of a place of love. What an incredible challenge today. And all, uh, as we look down through 1 Corinthians, we see uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. This is a big list of things, you know 1 Corinthians 13. It does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrong. Mothers, I have to be honest with you today, the Lord has recently, just in the last couple weeks, in all seriousness, convicted me on those last two phrases. Because I, I have to just confess to you, and I did, I have a small group that I'm a part of in the district and I was telling them, we were looking through this verse, and I said, you know what? I'm not doing real great on those last two. I do great with everybody but my family. Isn't it amazing how the family is the hardest place to demonstrate not getting easily angered and not keeping a record of wrong? And I, and I don't always do great with that with my wife and, and certainly with my kids. As I feel I'm raising them in the way they should go, how many times have I reminded them of all their mistakes? And I think, Lord... I need to learn a better way. I need to follow you in the way of love. And so the Lord's been convicting me on that in these last few days and weeks, actually. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 through 7, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That can be a message for our mothers in the room today, perseverance in love. Love perseveres continues in love. Not just that we persevere in doing, but we persevere in loving. What an incredible reminder. And then 1 Corinthians 14.1, uh, which comes after uh, that whole passage, it says, follow the way of love. And it's going on to talk about spiritual gifts and all these things that we can do in the Lord, but it's saying, if you do all that stuff but don't have love, don't think that it's going to count for anything because the Lord wants us to do everything we do motivated by his love. Now that's a lot to follow, but Christ throughout the scriptures makes it even more clearly when he gives us an understanding of how do I walk in that kind of love? And it's a lot simpler than having to memorize a list and work through it. It's this simple, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, follow God's example. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, Mary just said that today, 
Uh, we did not talk about that, but what a great tie into the message today. First and foremost, moms, dads, moms, you are, a, you are a daughter of the king, and he is loving you in the way he wants you to love your children. He's loving you in the way he wants you to love others. So follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The model is Christ. Amen? We can love like Christ, and we can look in the Word of God, and we can spend time with Jesus. The way that He ministers and loves us is the way that we should love others. It's a great John 13 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. We always say the great commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, right? And love others as you love yourself. You could probably argue here that Jesus is expanding on that command. He says here, a new command. I give you, not just love one another as you love yourself, but love one another as I have loved you. That's how you can love others. So Jesus comes on the earth and gives us a demonstration of how to do that. Isn't that nice of him? He shows us a step-by-step. It's, he's like, it's like YouTube before there was YouTube. It's a step-by-step instruction on how to do everything. And Christ has done that in a very special way, and we read about it in the Bible. Amen? Awesome. She said, yep. This is the same face she gives me every Sunday when I'm preaching. She's like, she has a yes face. My wife has a yes face. Well, we want to welcome to the stage today. Uh, We're going to have two mothers come up, but the first one is Holly Garman. Would you encourage Holly as she comes up to the platform today? I think it's okay. Yep. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so Ritzy wanted to ask you a question today. She's not remembering it, but ask her to introduce herself. There we oh, go. <laughs> <laughs> introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Holly Garman. For those who don't know me, um, I wanted to give just a little background on um, myself and my husband. Um, I'm a former elementary school teacher. Um, I'm now a full-time homemaker, or as Hannah Payne puts it, a domestic engineer. Nice. <laughs> um, my husband, Blake, is a physician, and uh, we moved here uh, about four years ago from Virginia. We've been members here at LAC for two years, and um, we have a two-year-old son named Asa. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we've been talking a little bit over the last couple of weeks, and we've been talking about this idea of loving like Christ. And I, I love you've, you've uh, showed me what you're going to share today, and I love that conversation we've had around what does it mean for you as a mother to follow that example, and how has the Lord done that uniquely in your own family and household to show you how to love like He loves? Thanks. Yeah. Um, So since Asa is an only child right now, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about him. Um, Thankfully, he's two, so he's not going to be easily embarrassed, and he's not even here, so we're good. (laughs) He's down in Children's Church. Um, And I know Erin, who's going to be getting up here and sharing in just a few minutes, um, being a mom of five, she's going to be sharing more about the love languages and individual personalities and how love is demonstrated there. Um, the other night, my husband actually asked Asa what his love language is, and he said, he looked him dead in the eye and said, um, mama, <laughs> which is the correct answer. <laughs> um, so I took a slightly different approach to think about love, and I thought about Asa's current toddler stage and how he's being formed by love, and one specific way that we do that as parents Um, So Asa's personality is uh, really just starting to emerge. So for any of you here at church who spent time with him, you'll know he's a very confident, very active little boy. He's a typical firstborn. So there's a lot of finger pointing involved in my day, a lot of um, the phrase, I must, or we must. (laughs) Um, And he's extremely persistent, very independent, almost for better or for worse. Um, He loves to sing and dance. He's very social. And as a stay-at-home parent, uh, my son really has the benefit of getting most, if not all, of my attention. (laughs) So he occupies nearly every moment of my day and sometimes my nights, as I'm sure you guys remember. Um, He's my constant little buddy. 
I involve him, I try to involve him in really everything that I do, whether it's running errands, preparing meals, cleaning, working in the garden. Um, and sometimes he's really helpful and we get along really well. And other times I feel like I'm in a toxic work environment <laughs> with that one coworker, you know, the one <laughs> that is like actively working against everything you're trying to do. Um, that's him sometimes. So. It can be really tempting, I think, in the life of any parent to focus on the mess yeah. and the delays and the tears and the tantrums and miss out on the beauty of the formation of this little person, this amazing formation that's happening right in front of you. Um, so after Asa has gone to bed, I look around our home and what I'm trying to train myself to see is instead of seeing just the mess, seeing the evidence of love that has been given and love that has been received all around me. So instead of just seeing the dirty dishes in the sink, it's evidence of the meal that we were able to share as a family. Um, instead of the muddy boots by the back door, I see evidence of the time that we spent together playing outside. But the things I really find myself tidying up the most at the end of every day are just piles and piles of books. Um, books on the coffee table, books on the floor, in our bed, on the couch, in the bathroom, like wherever, <laughs> you know, there's always a book somewhere. Um, and don't get me wrong, um, there are definitely times when I don't want to read another book, <laughs> but nothing holds Asa's heart like a good story. Um, and when I do slow down and I do read aloud to him, um, it is quite possibly the only time during the day when he will truly just sit still without any interruption. Um, he is totally enthralled by books. We often go through seasons where he requests the same book over and over and over again. Um, and he loves to show me the same thing he saw in that picture that last time we looked at it. He's going to point it out again. He likes to finish uh, familiar lines and he started retelling sections of stories in his own way. Um, and I've more frequently caught him reading quietly to himself in a corner of our home. You know that sound in your home when there is no sound? <laughs> and you think, something's going on. <laughs> There's something mischievous is going on. And usually it's mischief. But there have been more frequently times where it's just because he found a book and he's reading to himself. Um, so being a former elementary school teacher, um, you can imagine that I have a pretty robust collection of children's books. When I first met my husband, one of the very first things I did was scan his bookshelves to make sure that we could coexist peacefully. <laughs> um, and our sort of unspoken motto in our home is, if there isn't room for another book, you just build another shelf. Um, so in many ways, Asa has just been immersed in this world of books since the beginning. And I would describe him as a story-formed kid, which is a term I learned in a really wonderful memoir um, called Book Girl by Sarah Clarkson. And in that, she writes, next to scripture and the influence of my parents, great books have formed my worldview, developed my moral imagination, and shaped my idea of virtue. To read a story is to be shaped in the very depths of one's soul. Um, she goes on to describe reading really as a spiritual practice that we have to reclaim for ourselves first, and then we can pass that on to future generations. So as I pondered all of this in preparation for the prompt that you gave um, about loving our kids well and loving them in specific ways, um, I really wondered whether my husband and I read so much to Asa because he wants us to or because we want to. And I think I've figured out that it's both. And my point here is that love is formative. It forms us, our desires, our interests, our motivations, um, so much so that we can no longer figure out why we might love a certain thing. It's just part, it's woven into the fabric of who we are as a person. Um, love doesn't just bend to our wills and our inclinations. It molds us. It transforms us. And what an amazing opportunity we have to demonstrate that kind of love to our children. Um, Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. 
and he died for all, that those who live might not no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That phrase, the love of Christ controls us. Um, other translations say compels us, and it all leads to this. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So this formative love, this reconciling love God demonstrated to us as his children when he sent his son son into the world was the word became flesh. The word that spoke life into being, the word that fulfilled every Old Testament messianic prophecy, the word that continues to speak to each one of us today. Um, How does Jesus love each of us specifically? He gives us one word himself through this amazing book that we call the Bible, this unchanging character he has. Um, at first glance, it may not seem like God loves each of us specifically if he's just giving us all the same book, right? But the Bible is so unique in that the Holy Spirit is able to speak intimately and personally to each of us through it. Um, It is living. It's active. Um, It's the primary way that he has told us of his love. So we, too, ought to be story-formed by God's word, So coming back to the point, um, how do I specifically love Asa? I read to him, and I read to him a lot. (laughs) And not just because he wants me to, but because I love him. I hope that by doing this, I'm offering Asa an inheritance of words and stories um, so that when he really learns to dwell in God's word, he has this bone-deep knowledge of goodness, truth, and beauty. Reading will not only build his empathy for other people, but it will also remind him of the truth that good will always triumph over evil and to ignite his holy imagination and make space for God to live there. That is great. Yeah, that's so good. I, I love that, Holly. I, I love that you've shared it that way. And, I, and in the Old Testament, it says God has called us to pass on to the next generation those things that we have learned. And, and I love that concept. It's one that I, that, you know, we did when our kids were much littler, but, you know, there's that opportunity to have that captive audience and to share. And I think that, you know, the picture of Jesus as a word and as that everything we need is so powerful. So thank you for bringing that to our, to our hearts today. I, I, I find that in my own life that the Lord ministers to me in that way, and I often, it is often a struggle for me to know, and this has been throughout, you see this throughout the Bible, like parents had a hard time passing it on to the younger generation. Yeah. Oh, if you think about the Bible, it, it was really an oral tradition for a very long time, so people had to be storytellers to pass it on, and Jesus himself was such a storyteller. You know, we see that throughout Scripture, yeah. um, that he, he wanted to gather people and, and share those stories, and that he knew that by doing that, it was going to form yeah. who they were. Yeah, it's incredible. That's such a, such a powerful and great point to talk about that we don't think often about, that, that they were not. And I think, have we gotten lazy like other things that we have the Bible? Here, read your Bible to our kids rather than that we would read it to them, that we would recount what God has done in our own lives and use those opportunities between all the chaos of every day to just share what not only the, word of, the words of God here, but what God has done in our life and to pass that on to others. So it's really incredible. Holly, thank you so much. That is such great insight and really appreciate you and all you do as a mother uh, for your children. And uh, it's just a blessing to hear from you today. Can you thank Holly for coming to our table today? Thank you. So she mentioned uh, these love languages in 1992, many, many years ago. Uh, there was a book that came out by Dr. Gary Chapman entitled The Five Love Languages. How many of you are familiar with that? Yeah, it's, it's become pretty widespread. If you've never heard of it, I encourage you to check it out. Since then, there have been many follow-up books, How to Love Teenagers Through the Love Languages. And uh, Dr. Gary, a Christian um, author, 
really was, had a premise that we all give and receive love in very unique ways. There's different ways to demonstrate love. And he came up with these five uh, words of affirmation that there are some people who that's your primary love language. Like if somebody speaks words to you and affirms you, you feel and receive love in a more powerful way than maybe the other four. And it tends to be we all kind of receive it in a primary way. And usually, whichever way we receive love, we tend to give it to other people. If we want to show love to people, we think, well, I love to be encouraged with words, so that person will often be very good at affirming others with words, acts of service. This would have to be my, love, my wife's primary love language. Why couldn't hers have just been words of affirmation? I have lots of words, but now i got to do stuff, right? And, uh, and uh, acts of service, to, to give of yourself, to do things for people. Jesus talked about this at the Last Supper when he said, I'm going to show you the full extent of my love, and then he washed their feet, right? And he demonstrated to them how to serve. And so receiving gifts. Some of you in, in the room, you know, that's your wife's primary love language. You're, you're like, man, the bank is going broke. How much love can I possibly show her? And, uh, but, uh, you know, we think of that as a selfish thing, but giving somebody something, something of, of worth or of value or spending, that can be a, a great way to show and receive love. Quality time, this is the one for me that's primary. I love it to spend time with people, and um, I love when people spend time with me. And so maybe that's, that's yours, and then physical touch. That also, we often think of that as kind of a lesser form of it, but a, an appropriate touch on the shoulder or a handshake. All these things are a part of how we demonstrate to people that we see them and that we love them. And so we've been talking about some of those, and I want to invite Erin Zook, if she would come up to the platform today. Would you welcome Erin as she comes? Yourself. Oh, try again. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Good morning. My name is Erin Zook, and um, my husband Ken and I have been attending here at LAC for almost 10 years, which wow. was hard for me to believe when I thought about it. Um, we have five children. Uh, our oldest, Nathan, is 21, and he just finished his freshman year at Penn College. We have Micah, who is finishing up his freshman year at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana. Um, Ezra is in 11th grade here in Lewisburg area high school. We have Isaiah who's in seventh grade at the middle school and Anna who's in fifth grade at Lintown Elementary. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel so privileged to be up here and to be able to share with all of you today, um, knowing that I was gonna be up front had me thinking about all of you this whole week. And I was just truly thinking about how inspired I've been by so many of you in this congregation. Um, mothers are not, by the way I see you love, how I see you encourage others, serve others, how I've seen so many of you challenge and admonish others, and the difficult journeys and the hard roads that I've watched so many of you walk with bravery, with grace and hope in Christ. And I just want to thank you for your steadfastness in prayer. Um, I'm really grateful just to be a part of this family of believers. Um, I also know and realize that many of you here might just sort of tune out on a special Sunday like Mother's Day. Um, and I thought, what challenge or thoughts could I share with you that might be relevant? Um, so Gary Chapman's book that Pastor Dave was just mentioning has sold over 20 million copies. So obviously this is a topic that people are interested in. And I personally love studying. I've always been fascinated by people's personalities, how they form, why they form. And I think before I had children, I thought that you were shaped mostly by your environment. But after raising five human beings, I think I've come to the conclusion that you are certainly born with a lot of your personality. Um, so when I thought about examples of these five love languages and, and my children, I was thinking about when I was a brand new mom and my oldest, Nathan, was my fussiest baby. He just was not happy. But I had decided that I was going to practice attachment parenting, that I was going to wear him all the time, really focus on baby wearing. 
and could not figure, I thought I was doing everything right. I couldn't figure out why he was so unhappy. And so finally one day I was so frustrated, he was so frustrated, and I just put him down in his crib and he stopped crying. And I realized he just wants me to stop touching him. (laughs) (laughs) And when I finally figured that out, he was much happier to my sadness. But even to this day, physical touch is not his main love language. He's not a hugger. Um, He would prefer to probably keep his distance (laughs) from you. And, you know, so it was recognizing that we have ways that we want to love people. It's not necessarily the ways they want to be loved. And, you know, the benefit of having older children is that you can see their own love languages come out. And my kids minister to me. And um, recently, Isaiah, who's in seventh grade, this is so unusual. He came home from school one day, and I had cleaned the bathrooms that day with no prompting. I hadn't even told him what I had done that day. He said, hey, mom, thanks so much for cleaning the bathrooms for us today. And I almost fell over (laughs) on the floor. I... And I realized in that moment that words of affirmation are really important to me. And so that was so meaningful to me that he even noticed and did that. Now, speaking of Isaiah, um, so my, my second son, Micah, I would say that quality time and quality conversation are one of his love languages, and that's my main one. So he and I can just sit down and talk about feelings for hours and analyze situations and things that have happened. And um, that would probably be Isaiah's biggest nightmare, to sit down and talk (laughs) with mom about feelings. Um, So I've also been really challenged that to love like Jesus did, we have to be stretched outside of our comfort zone. I've had to learn about things I have zero interest in. Isaiah loves cars. And things like learning how to fix a motor. I don't, I, like, this hasn't even been on my radar screen as, you know, a 47-year-old. I've never even thought about. I don't know what any car any of you drive out here. He knows what all of you drive out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I realized for him it's um, sometimes just quality time. We went on a bike ride together. He's a great biker. I'm a terrible biker. But I knew that it would be meaningful for him if I went on a bike ride with him. That was super uncomfortable for me. But sometimes we have to stretch ourselves in order to uh, help our children feel loved. So um, I just also want to say I've been challenged. My daughter, Anna, she is a giver. She loves giving gifts. She likes receiving gifts, too. Um, but she sometimes will give it all. And I realized I can be stingy. Uh, She has wanted to literally give away all of her money many times, and that was difficult for me, and so that shone a spotlight on my own heart. So sometimes realizing how our children give and receive love can really be eye-opening. I feel that it's really a privilege to be able to raise human beings and to just experience these interactions and learn uh, how we can love each other in more individual and meaningful ways. Um, But 1 John 3, 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. It's amazing how we've all kind of highlighted this theme today, that we are the children of God. Mm -hmm. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It says in Matthew 7, 11. And as believers, it's our privilege to continue to strive in our relationships with other believers to love each other in deeper ways in the body of Christ. He calls us in Hebrews 10, 24 to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I'm astounded when I consider the ways that Jesus was using those five love languages that were behind us uh, more, you know, almost 2,000 years before Gary Chapman decided to write the ideas down <laughs> in a book. Um, I took some of this from Kurt Bennett's book, Love Like Jesus. In that book, uh, he gives a lot of examples of how Jesus used, which Dave also did, some of the five love languages. You think about physical touch. Jesus touched people. He got dirty. Um, I think about him actually spitting in the mud, putting it on the blind man's eyes. He didn't have to do that to heal him. 
but there are many examples of where he touched, he grabbed um, you know, Peter's mother, mother-in-law by the hand and lifted her up when he healed her. Um, he laid his hands on many, in many different ways to heal them. He gathered the little children in his arms. Um, I think of his words of affirmation. He affirmed the faith of the centurion. And uh, words of affirmation are sometimes speaking something positive out in front of others, not directly to that person, but so that others can hear. And Jesus did that often. He did that with John the Baptist, saying, those born, of those born of women, no one is greater. I think of the woman who anointed him with perfume. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, what she has been done will be remembered. Acts of service, as Dave mentioned, washing his disciples' feet would be the one that many of us would think of. Um, I thought about the bleeding woman who reached out, who had the faith to reach out to touch Jesus in the crowd, and it said that he felt the power go out of him. That is a, an a act of service. You know, and he, of course, his disciples thought that was kind of crazy. You're in a crowd. What do you mean who's touching you? But her faith, he responded to that faith. Um, Ultimately, the incarnation, simply Jesus taking on flesh, taking on our humanity, and then, of course, his ultimate sacrifice of giving his life for our sins on the cross. I think about how he gave good gifts. He gave lunch, bread and fish, to 5,000 people. Um, he gave his disciples the gift of power and authority to heal the sick, to drive out demons. Um, he spent quality time with people, his father in prayer, first of all, um, with his disciples. I think about how often they didn't understand some of his stories and what he was saying, and he always took the time to explain to his disciples the time he spent with Nicodemus and his questions um, and his time that he was criticized for, spending time with tax collectors and sinners. And, you know, just as Dave read to us, uh, my challenge is just to remember that greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, 34 to 40, it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Also, 1 John 4.12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Wow, that is amazing and very humbling to think that God lives in us and his love is made complete in us if we love one another. Just as I was reflecting on all these ways that Jesus has shown love, it just really made me feel so much love for him even more this week. And I would challenge you this week, read through the Gospels, read through some of the amazing ways that Jesus loved others, and also the book of 1 John, which talks a lot about the love of God. Um, I just want you to remember that Jesus meets us in the messiness of life. Uh, remember that he met Thomas in his doubting. He allowed him to physically touch his hands and his side, bringing him to understanding and belief. That he met the, road, the men on the road to Emmaus in their depression, their confusion, disillusionment, and he brought them truth and enlightenment. He opened their minds and he gave them hope. He met the woman caught in adultery who was thrown before him in her sin and her shame, her anger and her fear. And he brought her a chance for renewed life with better choices, not death and condemnation. There is no place or emotion that Jesus won't meet you in. So in my mind, based on the evidence of scripture, yes, God does indeed love us as individuals specifically, not only just as a collection of humanity. Uh, mothers can be truly wonderful, but the truth is also that the love of an earthly mother will disappoint and fail you at times. 
But please don't leave here today without knowing how amazingly Jesus loves you, specifically, individually, you. In light of this, in response to his amazing love, how can you be stretched to love the people in your life and in our church body in better and different ways this week? Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, you know, it, it seems, I, I love, like you said earlier, uh, we were talking about just seeing this theme of how we're loved as children of God is how we can love our children. And, but that word sacrifice just keeps coming back over and over again. And, and I, I feel convicted in my own heart as a dad and raising kids and that I often am trying to love them in a way that will work for me more so than what really works for them. And love is sacrificial. We have to, we're trying in wisdom to learn how to love people, certainly our children, the younger people. We're trying to love them in a way not that satisfies us, but that would really communicate that love to them. And that takes wisdom. That takes the, the Holy Spirit leading us into how to love people well. And I love that. That's a challenge for us to really consider that, as you talked about it, with, with our different... We, we discovered the same thing with our, with our kids. We're like, man, they really are different uh, immediately. And how we love them should also be different. And how we, we can show physical ways of that is really important. Yeah. So, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, um, as we close, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up, and we're going to get ready to close our our service. But Aaron, you had this song on your heart. Yeah, just um, as I, again, was was thinking through the how Christ loves and all these, it just made me want to have a response to him. And I thought of the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, um, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. And I love the chorus where it says, oh, for grace to trust him more. May we all trust him more and more. And um, I was just hoping we could sing maybe two verses. And um, the, I think the words are going to be up. But um, the third verse says, um, yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. And isn't that what we want as mothers? <laughs> life and rest and joy and peace. Yeah. And that would just certainly be my prayer for all of you today. <laughs> yeah, Mary, would you lead us in that? And we'll sing the first verse. Would you sing along with us this beautiful hymn to the Lord? It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him more and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Third verse? Third verse? Yeah. yeah. That's the second verse. <laughs> We have it? Yes, tis sweet there to trust in Jesus. <laughs> Let's sing it together. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I fruit him more and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. So, Lord, today we just... Um Thank you for the love that you have demonstrated to us, for how, Jesus, you sacrificially gave of yourself, 
in the most inconvenient way to come from heaven to earth, to be God in the flesh, and to demonstrate clearly what it would look like if we would love like the Father. Thank you that you've given us that road map, those directions on how not only to trust you, but to love like you do. Lord, we thank you for these moms today who have shared. We thank you for each mom who has given so sacrificially. May we all leave this place committed to loving others like you have loved us. Thank you, Lord, as we follow you in the way of love, that you would assist us by your Spirit, that you would guide us, remind us, help us, in loving others. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we